Hi there, this is Luisa Heinzel. Thank you very much for joining me today. Today I would like to give you some of my personal tips and tricks to create backgrounds with Distress Oxide inks. In the end of the video we will hopefully <laughs> have something like this. You could use such a background for a card, for example, a greeting card, a wedding card or whatever. You could use that for a journaling card for your junk journal or you could make a background on a tag for your junk journal or you could, of course, even use this technique on a junk journal page to create a background. Um, and then later on, you could put a collage on top to make the page complete. I have noticed that there are many of you out there who are new to Distress Oxide inks and I think you have some questions. You have written some questions below my past videos and you've also messaged me on Instagram and Facebook Messenger or via email and you've asked me several different things and I thought <clears throat> perhaps those people who have messaged me are not the only people <laughs> who have questions about that so I thought I'm going to do a really quick video about a technique that is actually relatively easy. It takes a little bit of time because we need some drying time in between, but it's really easy and especially fun to do. What I've also noticed is that some of you have already used the Distress ink pads in the past, for example, for a very long time, always Distress ink. And now you came to the idea that you want to buy some Distress Oxides as well. And some of you, um, I think, um, have a problem with getting out everything that this medium can do. I, of course, don't mean that bad or something, yeah? <laughs> But your questions show me that some of you have problems to yeah get out of the ink what the ink can do and especially with this oxide effect um it looks like some of you have problems to get out the whole thing of this medium as i said i want to create a background like this as you can see this is embossed so we will create the background first and then i will show you how you can get this cool effect to your background with the help of clear embossing powder the first thing that you should think about is the paper that you want to use i am mostly using watercolor paper for several different reasons for cards and tags and that stuff I know for a junk journal page that is not always possible, but I will talk about that in a second as well, how you can manage that if you don't have watercolor paper in your junk journal. I mean, mostly um, we have junk in our junk journals, yeah, and that could be a problem. This watercolor paper <coughs> is this one here. It's available on Amazon Germany. If I can find that for um, Amazon USA as well, I will link that down below for you. So this has 300 GSM, um, but I think it's not um, totally necessary that you have exactly this paper. Yeah, I get many, many questions always when I show a paper that I use, you ask me, where can I get exactly that paper? I think... Um, you need to know some things about the paper to get a paper that works for you. Yeah, It's not necessary that you have exactly this paper. This paper here, and that's something that you could consider for your project as well, has a relatively rough and textured side here. Can you see this little texture here? Um, that is nice and it gives a really interesting effect but it gives a totally different effect than the back side of the paper. Here you can see the paper is really, really smooth and it has no, tech, or let's say nearly no texture on it. You can see those really small gaps here, but that um, doesn't influence the effect so much. So it's relatively flat. Um, to show you the difference, and um, to be able to explain why I like the smoother side better, I will do the following thing for this tutorial. I will create one background on this textured side and the other background on the smooth side so that you can later on compare both of these and decide what you like better. 
<clears throat> it is really helpful to have, for example, an acrylic plate like this here. This is from a set by Tim Holtz. Those acrylic plates are really, really helpful, not only for this technique, but also for stamping. They come, I guess, in a pack of nine or so, eight or nine in different sizes. And I really like that they are available in different sizes because then you can choose the size that is handy for your project. And for those cards, as you can see, this is just perfect. For today, I have chosen a color combination that is relatively new to me. I have tried it out already here, but uh, yeah, <laughs> let's see. It's a little bit ex like an experiment, but I have chosen those colors that are new to me as well because I want to be the closest to your reality yeah when you buy some oxide inks then of course you don't know how will they react on the paper and what will they do with my background so i thought i um try that here as close to the reality as possible and yeah so let's start with pumice stone i have this color new in my collection and i'm totally in love with this color so I'm taking the ink pad and I'm putting the ink directly to my acrylic plate here. The color is relatively light. You can see this is a, like a brownish gray. The color is relatively light. So I'm putting a little bit more ink um, to the plate in the first step to get a nice, yeah, like base color to my card. On the right side, you can see the back side of the watercolor paper. And on the left, you can see the front side, meaning this is the textured paper and this is the smooth paper so that you know uh, what I'm doing here. Now I'm taking some water and I'm spritzing this here to my plate. I'm using not too much water. Um, that is always hard to explain how much water shall I use. Sometimes I see people spritzing really a lot water to the ink. That, of course, gives you then a way lighter result on your card than if you spritz less water. I like to do it, um, yeah, like I've just done it, <laughs> as you can see, perhaps here. When you press the ink pad and turn it around a little bit, then you get like those rectangles from the ink pad. Here you can see it a little bit. And I try to add as much water um, that those rectangles disappear. Yeah, so now it looks like it has rained to my acrylic plate. I don't want to have those rectangles on my plate anymore. Otherwise, I will like transfer them to my card. And I don't want to have rectangles on my card, of course. So let's first take the smooth card. I'm just turning it around. And for the first layer, I like to press it down carefully so that the, the ink can't fly out there on the side. Because I want to have my first layer relatively, yeah, like over the whole card. Then I take that off. Make sure that you don't have too much ink here on the side of the card, on, the, on this edge, because um, otherwise that dries relatively uh, ugly. So I'm trying to turn that around so that the ink can flow a little bit to the middle of the card. And as you can see, we already have some color here. It's really light, but you know, it's the first layer. So let's do the same thing on the textured card. I'm using the ink that I still have here and I'm doing exactly the same, pressing this carefully in here. And when I lift this up, you can already see a really big difference. I will now dry both of the cards with my heat gun and then we are go going to use um, the rest of the ink from here. So this is what they look like when they are completely dry. Of course, this could be an effect for a tag or a journaling page as well. You could already call this a background, I would say. But when you look at the paper um, and you see this like smooth paper on the right, 
you have a totally different feeling about the background than on this texture paper on the left. While I'm putting the second layer here to both of the cards, I want to talk a little bit about paper that you could put into your junk journal. I mean, I think the most of you who are watching my channel um, also create junk journals like I do. And we often have paper like, for example, packaging paper that is um, soaking mediums relatively fast and relatively good. So if you have a paper that soaks your medium really, really well and fast, then you should, you can also use the oxide inks, of course, on those papers, but you should first um, take something like a sealer or a primer to put that on your page. You could use, for example, some clear gesso for that or other sealers that are available. Um, you could also use a watercolor ground. Uh, I don't know if you know that. I can't show you that because I don't have that medium, but I know some crafty friends who are doing that with their junk journal pages to make them, yeah, ready for using the oxide ink. You could put such a medium to the page to seal it on the one hand so that the oxide ink can't go directly and so fast especially into the paper and the different sealers of course give you also a different kind of texture to your page meaning if you use for example clear gesso that is relatively thick and you would use a bigger paintbrush then you could um, paint it on and then you will probably see the brush strokes that your brush has made and that gives you something like a texture like we have on this paper here on the left hand side as well um, and that is something that you have to have in mind when you want to choose a sealer or a primer for your page because with the second layer you can see how different this whole thing reacts really crazy isn't it i will dry this again when it comes to using different colors of the oxide ink or also the distress inks i think the confusion <laughs> is relatively big because both the distress inks and the distress oxide inks are water soluble yeah and when you think about layering those colors on top of each other you might think hey that can't work when i spritz water here but it works i will show you how so first of all i'm taking a paper towel and i'm cleaning my plate i want to make sure that i don't have any ink left here on the plate sometimes it also gets below the plate make sure that it is completely clean and especially dry you don't want to get water to your ink pad or your oxide ink pad. This technique that I'm showing you today is also possible with the Distress inks. You could do exactly the same thing that I'm doing here today with your Distress inks. But, of course, the Distress inks don't give you this oxide effect that we get here to our cards with, with those kind of inks. yeah. But the technique could be done with the Distress inks as well. Next, I want to add some of this color here, Evergreen Bow. <laughs> I am a little bit <laughs> excited about that because here on this card, to be honest, it came out a little bit too much for me. Yeah, I have the feeling that <laughs> this um, composition is a little bit uh, strange because he has a lot of green and um, actually I thought I wanted to have this gray um, from pumice stone and later on lost shadow in the foreground and this <laughs> went a little bit not like I planned it even if I like it now but let's see if we can do that better so I'm taking taking evergreen bow and I'm using only a tiny little bit because yeah I've learned something for <laughs> For the other cards I've used way too much um, and that is also something that could happen to you because sometimes when you buy those ink pads and um, you have them new yeah you take them right out of the package and you put the ink to your acrylic block sometimes it looks like there's not so much ink on here 
Then you spritz water, put your paper in and you think, holy crap, what is that? Why is here so much ink? Um, so please be a little bit careful with the amount of the ink, especially with those um, BAM colors like <laughs> Evergreen Bow. So let's spritz some water here as well. Here I'm using a little bit more water than before because... Um, I mean, compared to the amount of ink that I have here, because I want to have the green layer that will be my first green layer on those cards really light so that I can control it better. If you want to layer the Distress Oxide inks, please make sure that your layers that you've done before are totally dry. Um, because you don't want to have a mixture out of Evergreen Bow and uh, pumice stone but you want to have the evergreen bow on top of the pumice stone we are going to do the same thing here i am just pressing this in here Ooh. and make a little mess on my table like this and then i'm going to dry this and as you can see this first layer of the evergreen bow looks really like translucent but it's there and you can see the other color pumice stone through it meaning the more water you use the more translucent the layer gets on the textured paper it looks totally different because you can see the pumice stone uh, underneath way better because it was way more intensive in the very beginning when we've done that so you can of course create something like this you could again leave this exactly like it is or you can of course add more layers but I like to use uh, when I have a neutral color in the background like um, pumice stone and then I add a color a color color <laughs> like evergreen bow I like to um, make the first layer a little bit translucent to get more interest and more depth to my background what I also like to do is, when I have something like this here left over, I like to take a paintbrush and splatter some of those really light splatters here to my background. And I like to use, uh, I like to, um, sorry, I like to let those air dry because that way they get really, really nice. And um, if you use a heat gun to dry your splatters, they can end up like those lines. Do you know, uh, like we have done it in the kindergarten with a straw and then we've blown the splatters away to get little like suns or uh, abstract flowers or something like that. And I don't like that. And, you know, I'm <laughs> sometimes a little bit not so patient. And then when I dry it with my heat gun, I get all of those lines and I don't like that. Um, so I will let this air dry. So this is completely dry now after yeah, it felt like 352 hours. But <laughs> if you are a little bit impatient, you could also let this dry for, let's say, five minutes or so so that the water can't go around so much anymore and then you could take your heat gun and dry it from the other side so just hold the card like this or for example with a tool like this to don't burn your fingers and then you can just hold your heat gun below the paper and dry it from the other side then the water can't um, fly around here what you also could do in the meantime <laughs> you could take a cookie Perhaps you're wondering why I'm eating here while my uh, while I'm recording this video. That has a reason because I got those awesome cookies and not only these but <laughs> a lot more from a very cute viewer and I wanted to take this as a symbol for all of your kindness that you have given me. You have sent so so many happy mails to me in the last few months oh, those smell absolutely fantastic and you have given me the chance to eat and feel and see and touch things that I had never before in my life like those cookies
Mm. Mm. Holy crap. This says French toast inspired cookies dipped in delicious icing. Mm. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for this and for all of your happy mails that you have sent to me. It, it's just incredible. And I also want to thank you for all of your donations that you have sent to my PayPal account and also here on YouTube with this super <laughs> super thanks uh, button. You have been so generous and that helps so much. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of that that you have given to me. Ooh, and when you have some waiting time because of drying, this is of course really helpful. And this is so delicious. Oh my goodness. I'm wondering how, how long they will be there on my table. Hopefully, hubby has lots to do, not here today, <laughs> in his own home. So that he doesn't come to me and eat those. <laughs> so, ah, okay, so let's go on with those backgrounds. As you can see, when this is dry, we have some really nice splatters here. And you can already see, um, like, I would call this a light oxidation. Yeah, for, for my projects and when i compare that to other projects then i would say this is a light oxidation and perhaps you have seen something like this on your backgrounds as well and perhaps you think how can i get that a little bit more extremely with the oxidation i will show you that with the next layers that we add to those backgrounds i will again take evergreen bow i have cleaned and dried my plate because now I want to add a little bit more ink. <clears throat> Hopefully not too much again, like with the other bowl. <clears throat> then we are going to add some water again. And then we are again dipping this into the ink, but not completely. So as you could probably see, I take the card and I take two or three fingers or only one finger that's also possible and I just dip it into the card with this layer still relative aggressively I would say deep much of the ink here and here mm, with the next layers I will do that not so aggressively but before I can show you that I will dry this and while I dry this I um We'll look what the ink is going to do. When I start here, you will um, in a second see in the video that it starts to dry here and you can see that it um, starts to dry and then it's going to be completely dry here. But here, I'm assuming something will happen and I will dry it and then I will show you what happens here and what I'm doing then because I think that is something... Uh, I mean, I have never seen someone doing that. Yeah, perhaps it's something that is not shown in videos or so, but um, I find that relatively helpful. So I will share that with you. So I'm going to start drying. And what you have just seen was real time. Yeah, I have not speed up the video to um, show you how fast it dries here. And the oxidation, as you can see here, gets really intensive compared to the other layers that we've done before. But now here you can see some areas where lots of water is. And if I would dry this completely with my heat gun, there would be two problems. The first problem is that there's, you know, this danger to blow the ink across your paper and then we have a line of ink here. We don't want that, perhaps. And the second, and for me, uh, way more, yeah, like, ugly problem is that when those areas dry completely, there's so much of the ink, so much medium, that it looks ugly. 
And when you go over that with your finger, when it's dry and you turn your finger, you have the ink on your finger because here's too much of the ink on the paper. That is my opinion and my experience and what I don't like. It can happen that you dry it and you experience that and that you like it, of course. Yeah, you do you. But um, for all of you who don't like that, and especially if you don't want to smear your ink, I have a trick. Dry it until you have this, until it is not completely dry and you can see those really, really wet areas. And then take it and just dip it into the ink again, because the, then those areas will be like destroyed and of course you get more ink another layer to your background but those extreme areas will be destroyed then you can dry it again until you see those areas dip it in again dry it again and so on so i will quickly do this here as well <clears throat> again i stop drying when i can see those bigger like wet areas and <clears throat> i also have the feeling that the oxidation gets way nicer when you do it this way than drying this completely and um, another thing that i want to mention but we can't see it here so good so i can't show you that so good ah, yeah here perhaps you can see it a little bit sometimes when you have a lot of ink on your paper that is still wet then you can see a grayish like little whirlwind on top of the water. When you see that, that is part of the oxidation, of course. Yeah, this chalky finish that the oxide ink leaves um, is, of course, in the water and not in the water, in this mixture of water and ink before it's completely dry. And sometimes it happens that you get those little, yeah, swirly things on top of the water i think it's good to stop drying when you see this grayish stuff and dip the card into the ink again i think that is a personal thing but i like um, the results better when you do it like that and when you don't get this like chalky thing on the water dry it completely because then the oxidation has also another color the oxidation of evergreen bow is relatively bluish gray as you can see and if you have too much of this white stuff and you dry that then it gets like really white and and extremely chalky and for me it's not my cup of tea yeah? i don't like that so much so um i do it like this and also here we can dip it again into the ink and the more layers i add the less the the less <laughs> the less pressure <laughs> sorry i add to my card when i press that into the ink and you can see the ink um is not so much here anymore because yeah we have it on the card here of course so um the less ink you have here the tinier your details get and that's what I like about those oxide ink backgrounds. And that's also something that I think um, some of you don't have in mind or they, they don't know. You don't perhaps know that you can do that because I think those tiny details make the difference. And I think <laughs> we could add um, a little bit more of the pumice stone or even some of the lost shadow. Um, to get a little bit more gray to our cards. So we can do the following thing. We can just apply one color here. So this is Lost Shadow. And the other color here, this is Pumice Stone. And now I'm spritzing only a tiny little bit of water here because I don't want this to become too fluid. And then I'm taking my finger. You can also take a paintbrush. Barbara, take a paintbrush. <laughs> Barbara at 49 Dragonflies always <laughs> sends me messages. And she says, Louisa, my fingers are stained. I have used oxide ink or oxide spray. And now I have dirty fingers. I don't like that. What can I do? <laughs> Use a paintbrush, Barbara. 
<laughs> I'm only kidding, of course. <laughs> so if we want to have more smaller details, then um, and we have lots of ink here, then we can take the card and really loosely do it like this. Ooh, that's much. Not so hard. Just like this. Aha, uh -huh, that's better. To get tinier details of the other color here. So, of course, the lighter and the faster you do this, the tinier your details get. And here I want to add more of those tinier uh, areas and those tiny details, but I will first dry this. And here I'm doing it exactly like I have done it before, yeah? So please don't be confused. If I see something that is really, really wet and where I can see there's lots of medium here, I leave it wet and I'm just turning it around and dipping it into here again. And as you can see, we get those tiny, tiny details here and that will look really awesome in the end. And the drier this is, the better that works. As you can see now, they get really, really tiny and really detailed. And um, of course, the drier your plate gets, meaning the more layers you have done to your card with the help of the ink that was here and the water, um, the less problems you get with those really wet areas. When you have this here on your plate, this is so dry that you can get those tiny dots, but you will not have those really wet areas anymore. So that you then, of course, when you have this, dry it completely without having those wet areas and the problem with too much medium on in one spot. <laughs> I think I want to use pumice stone again because that gives a really nice like vintage touch to it. So I'm adding some ink to my plate again. A tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of water. And then I take a wet paintbrush. And I like to use this kind of brush for splattering. For me, that's the best splatter brush. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I got that from Barbara at 49 Drank Flies. She has gifted that to me a while ago. And since I have it, I'm totally in love with this brush. It's very, very cool. Okay, so um, we can let this air dry now or we could also use this little trick and dry it from the back side of the paper. Um, I will, I think, have another co uh, cookie and a coffee and then I will be back so I will let this air dry. So here yeah, I am back. Ooh, I'm sorry. As you can see, the result is really, really different on the smooth paper here on the right and on the textured paper here on the left side. I like the right one better, but of course that's totally personal preference, what you like better. With those different layers and lots of layers, as you could see, the oxidation gets really really extremely as you can see we get this really wonderful bluish gray here from evergreen bow we get also yeah like a light beige from pumice stone and that comes because we have layered and dried it yeah if you have lots of layers the oxidation gets more extreme than if you have only one or two layers and when you have this, of course, you can leave it like it is. Or what you also could do is you could um, put some clear embossing powder here on top with the help of a stamp and make the background even more interesting. I'm using a stamp from the Letter Script stamp set CMS 241 by Tim Holtz. And I have chosen this one here because I think that we can create a cool script here on some areas of our background. Um, on both of these that I have made for the German video, I have stamped the stamp to the whole card, as you can see. But here I want to try to get the stamping and embossing only to the green areas. Yo. 
That means we have to apply it here. I can't see anything. I will add the powder. So this is, by the way, a clear embossing powder by Ranger. So let's just add this here and hope for the best. Ooh. Let's see. Ooh, I think this was really successful. I will quickly emboss that with my heat gun. Ha <laughs> ha. As a junk journaler, you have to be happy about the small things. <laughs> Especially if you try techniques like embossing, for example, that normally um, is meant for the cut making pros and experts. <laughs> I, I've just thought while I have embossed this, a junk journalist's life is not so easy because we want to try out different techniques. We want to include so many different things into our journals that we need to know different techniques but that's sometimes not so easy and embossing is one of those things where i think you really need to be an expert <laughs> to get nice results but if you have a really lucky day and perhaps it's because of those cookies that this got really really good i really like that I really like that. It's probably not perfect, but I really like it. And I especially like that it is only here on this main green area. So let's try something similar here to see how the embossing looks on the textured background, because that is uh, totally different. On this textured paper, the stamp impression is really loose. Um, in some areas... I th think in the camera you can't see that so good, but in reality, in some areas, this looks like really tiny braille paper because you can't see the clear stamp impression because of the texture of the paper. But I think, whoo, I'm sorry, but I think that can give a really interesting effect for a background as well. I would be really interested in what you like better and which one you would prefer for making a card background or a journaling card or on a junk journal page. Which one do you like better, the smoother paper or the textured paper? I hope you like this. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. And I wish you a lot of fun with creating your own Oxide Ink backgrounds or... <laughs> Of course, I wish you fun with whatever you do at the moment. And I hope we will see you the next time. Bye-bye.